Some things in life are just inherently boring. For example, waiting in line at the bank, filing your taxes, or looking at your co-workers' baby pictures. I'm sorry, Greg, I just don't care that your infant learned how to walk. Talk to me again when he can do a backflip. The equivalent of your co-workers' baby pictures in chess would probably be the London system. This opening has a reputation of being incredibly boring. It's not that it's a bad opening, it's just that you play the same no matter what your opponent does. So you just go through the same moves, neither you nor the other player is really excited, but it gets the job done. Kind of reminds me of my sex life. But what happens if a world champion that's famous for his attacks would play the London system? And what if that world champion would play an opponent that's not quite as strong as his opponents normally are? Someone like a strong international master? Wouldn't that be an opportunity for a lot of unnecessary sacrifices and a very interesting game? Past world champion Garry Kasparov played with the white pieces against strong international master from Romania, Adrian Negulescu. He starts with d4 and we have knight to f6. And at the beginning, we just have the normal opening moves of the London system. Funny enough, his opponent plays the King's Indian, which is an exciting opening, but also has the reputation of you can just blitz out your moves and basically pre-move them no matter what your opponent does. So they play all of the normal moves, bishop coming to f4, very, very standard stuff in the London. We have this uh, d6 move and pawn coming to h3. h3 is already an interesting move. You don't normally play this in the London, but you almost always play it in the London against the King's Indian. In the normal London, if the knight tries to attack your bishop, you just move back, knight takes, you take back with the h-pawn, and then you have an open file for your rook. And uh, usually white gets a big attack here with, for example, queen to d3 or bishop to d3, uh, knight g5, and you all pile up on the h-pawn. The problem is, that black already has a lot of defense against this kind of attack with the fianchetto setup. So it doesn't really work. But you still want to keep your black squared bishop. That's why you play h3 pretty fast in the London against the king's Indian. Uh, we have castles by black, very normal, and the bishop coming to e2. Also a very standard move in the king's Indian. Most people like to play it on d3 in the London, but it's more common to play it uh, on e2 when you play against the King's Indian. Black develops the knight, we have castles, and queen to e8. Again, when these two openings face each other, some nuances uh, you have to do differently. Normally, you would play the rook here, but again, in the London, it does not really work. It's not bad in itself, but uh, if I play c3 and you thought you prepared e5, you are losing a pawn because I take, you have one, two, three defenders and one, two, three attackers, which would be fine normally, but there's this tactic. I take, you take back, I take, let's say with the knight, knight takes and now white exchanges queens first. You have to take back with the rook, otherwise you're just down a queen. No one is defending this knight. And after I take, white is just up a pawn in a very, very comfortable position. That's why, Black didn't play rook to e8, preparing e5, but queen to e8, preparing e5. Because now you can't take the queen on d8, because it's not on d8. Chess or whatever, where you learn a new thing every day. <laughs> the bishop is dropping back, because e5 is now possible, and you don't want your bishop to be hit with a tempo. Uh, so e5 is happening anyways. Most of the time, as the London player, you don't want to take on e5, because when you take back, white usually just crashes forward with e4 and gets a lot of initiative. You don't want to take immediately. Mostly you want to take at some point later in the game, but uh, you gotta have a reason for that. So of course Kasparov didn't take, but he played c4. Maybe a bit almost too aggressive for a London. It's of course a very good move. Uh, most players would play c3 in the London, but I mean, He's a very aggressive player, so you, you gotta play c4 here. The knight is coming to e4, and we have knight d2 immediately challenging this knight. Here we have f5, the king's Indian move. This is a mistake. Now, why is this a mistake? Normally, it's very important that in the king's Indian, you first close up the center. This is very important, because if you don't close up the center and play f5, your king is just very vulnerable from, for every attacks on this diagonal. 
And this will be exactly what's happening in this game. So very instructive moment here. You first want to close the center, either play e4 yourself or provoke white somehow to play d5. But you can't just play f5 here. It's really not a good move. We have uh, d takes e opening up the center because now your king is open. White's king is perfectly safe, so white is perfectly fine with just opening up all of the center. Uh, the knight takes here, we have queen takes, and the pawn takes back. Yes, black has a lot of space, but also this diagonal is really not looking good. So white develops his rook, everything fine, and we have queen to e7. And Kasparov plays c5. c5 is here to open up the position. You want this bishop freeing up on this diagonal to the king. Yes, the pawn is hanging, but not really. Because if you take, I simply take on e5. You could take back, but then queen to d5 check. Forking the king and the bishop. The bishop is twice attacked now and only once defended. Already here the problems start with this weak diagonal to the black king. So of course black saw this and didn't take, but played an in-between move first. He played e4, getting his pawn out of the way with a tempo. What he didn't expect though is that Kasparov just does the same. He played c6. And yes, this again hangs the pawn, but it's really not that big of a deal. Because if you take, first of all, these pawns are very weak. You will lose your pawn anyways after this move, so you might as well weaken the opponent's position when you give it away. And also, if you really want to win your pawn back, it's not that hard. You play knight to d4, yes, black can defend it, but I just take you, you take back, and now no one is defending this, and that's just much better for white. But Kasparov didn't do this. He played queen to a5 first, activating his queen more and preparing for some savage tactics. We have the pawn moving out of the way, so you don't win it, and the knight moves. But now this pawn is attacked. So of course, if the pawn is twice attacked and only once defended, you defend it again. And this is a huge mistake by black, because Kasparov is not giving a damn and just takes it anyway. You can take this back. Because if you take it back, I play the insane rook to d8 check. You can't take with the queen because I take your queen, you just lose a queen. If you move the rook in between, your queen is hanging. And if you move the bishop in between, I still take your queen. Yes, you can take back, but who is defending the horsey? So I take back and now I just have a huge attack. And after something simple like let's say you move away the rook I just attacked with a tempo, I play bishop to c4. And this is almost checkmate. The king has no escape squares. You can either move your bishop in the way and I win your rook just completely for free. I mean, first I would take the bishop with check, you take back and then I win your rook. Uh, or you move the rook in between and I just win your rook. So this position is terrible for black. White is just crushing here. Now, Black being a very strong Grandmaster saw the tactic after Kasparov took the pawn. He moved away his attacked rook, and uh, Kasparov just moved away his knight with a tempo on the queen. We are attacking now, this is looking bad for Black. The queen moves out of the way, of course, it's attacked, and Kasparov sacrifices his knight again. He really does not like that horsey, doesn't he? Now, this time Black takes it, because the reason of the sacrifice isn't as immediate as it was before. You win your piece back, but you don't win a piece afterwards. Kasparov takes the knight, and you can pause the video here to see if you find the reason why black can't take back this bishop. I hope you found it. After black takes, you play rook to d8, simply winning the queen. Black of course saw this and didn't take back, so the piece that Kasparov sacrificed, he already got that back. Now, you move the rook in between, now I could take back, because the queen is no longer defending the rook on d8. So Kasparov exchanges the bishop, we have rook takes, and white takes the hanging pawn. So white is up a pawn now, let's go. The bishop is moving here, trying to trap the queen actually. Now, first of all, of course, your bishop is attacked, but if you just defend the bishop, I play rook b7, and your queen does not have any squares. This is protected, this is protected, and the rook is protected. You get a lot of compensation though, so this game would be far from over after takes takes. I have two rooks for the queen and a bishop for the rook, so 
It's all right also because I have a strong pass pawn and this pawn is very weak and isolated, but still, this is better for black, obviously. Now, white obviously saw this and just took the bishop. We have rook takes, forking the queen and the pawn, but after the queen goes out of the way, you don't really want to take the pawn, because if I play rook to d7, this is just way, way too active. Like, if you move in between all right, you can stop various tactics, but I just go rook d1 and I'm just way too active now. There are all sorts of tactics approaching. So black saw this and didn't take the pawn, but first played rook to c6. The queen is moving out of the way even further, and we have queen to f7. Here we enter a period of shuffling. I won't go into every move with as much detail as I usually do, but uh, the important moves I will, I will describe. So we have this check, of course, you block it. Uh, check again, the king moves out of the way, check again, the queen blocks it, and here we get the rook into the action. So we shuffle a bit to get the rook into the action with a tempo. The king moves out of the way, it looks safe, but it's not really. The queen is giving another check, and the pawn moves in the way. This is good, but again, the king is just very weak and under attack, it does not really have any shelter. Black, in general, uh, while they are shuffling, has a much, much better position. First of all, the king is way safer. I mean, that's just the safest king ever. It's really relaxing back here. This king isn't safe at all. The pieces are a bit more active, but also a, a huge problem in Black's position is this pawn is isolated and extremely weak. If white would want to win it, it would be very easy. And those pawns are connected, and one of them is a passer. Yes, these pawns are hanging for the longest time, but black can't really take it, because there are various tactics at stake. For example, if you would take it right now, just to show you one quick example, I play queen to g8, four king made in one, and your rook. This is already over. So you most of the time just can't take this, because white just has such an active position. Uh, Black tries to exchange rooks, which is uh, very sensible, and white decides to, yes, we can exchange, but I want to get my rook into the game. So we play king to d1, uh, takes, king to d1, of course, rook to d1, uh, black takes, and white takes. Yes, this rook would be better up here, but it has the open file now, file now and it will just drop back. Uh, the position, again, it looks equal for the amateur mind, but this king is very safe, this king isn't, weak pawn, strong connected pawns, and one of them even a passer. Again here, you can take it, I play rook to d6, winning your queen. So yes, this pawn is hanging for like 10 moves now, but somehow Kasparov manages to put his opponent under so much pressure that you just can't take a hanging pawn. And this in an extremely boring opening like the London, I love it. Uh, the rook attacks the queen, not much to say here, queen moves out of the way, and uh, the queen goes to e7, we have b3, this pawn could have been taken now, so Kasparov defends it, the rook attacks the other pawn again, and we have the queen coming to c8, and finally black manages to take the pawn. But this is also black's downfall, <laughs> because now I take this pawn, and all of your pawns are separated, yeah, that, that's not really separated, but just... Just give Kasparov a second for that. Uh, the rook is coming back to defend stuff, but this is really not looking good. Oh boy. We have the rook coming to c7, and we have h4, breaking up black's position. He takes, and here Kasparov misses a mate in three. You can pause the video and see if you are better at chess than Gary Kasparov. Yes, that's how it works. If you found the mate in three, you would definitely beat the world champion. It's the quiet move, queen to g4. That's probably why he didn't spot it at the end of a game with uh, not as much time. Quiet moves are very difficult to spot, but you can't stop rook to h5. There's no possibility. Like, black just sacrificed the queen here, you take, and now again you can't stop rook to h5. There's nothing to do. So he misses the maiden 3, but he finds another winning move. We have rook to e5 attacking the queen. Queen has to move out of the way, queen to f4, black moves out of the way, and resigns. Back then, that was kind of in fashion to make a move and then resign. I don't know why, why you would do that, but that's just how it worked. 
Now, why did Black resign? Of course, White is just crushing here, but White has an immediate threat. White would play check. You can't go here, because again, that's made in one. So you move to the front, I check again, you move away, I check again, and now you don't have any more squares to go to. You have to go on one of these squares, and no matter which square you choose, I just win your queen. Oh, and I'm still attacking you. Oh, and your pawns are terrible. Oh, and my queen is extremely safe. So Black just uh, really didn't want to go any further with this. He knew that he would definitely lose this game, so he resigned.